Well, needless to say, brethren, it's a great joy as well as a sacred privilege to stand before you once more in order to consider together those matters that will be included in this, the seventh unit of our pastoral theology modules. And I extend a special thanks and warm welcome due to those of you who've blocked out the time, undergone the expense to join us for these lectures. And then I also welcome those of you who in many different circumstances, times and places, are watching these lectures in their DVD format. You're welcomed after the fact, and we trust God's blessing will be upon you as you view and listen to these lectures. In our previous times together, God's been gracious to give all of us present in those modules a wonderful sense of his presence and of his help as we've attempted to think our way through some of the most basic issues relative to the biblical teaching concerning the work of the Christian ministry. And I'm personally convinced that this sustained consciousness of the Lord's help and presence has been in great measure the direct result of God's gracious answer to our prayers. So then, again, and this our first session together, let's bow before our great and gracious God, seeking his presence and blessing not only upon this hour, but upon all of the sessions in this particular unit of our study. Let's pray together. Our Father, we are commanded again and again in your word to approach you with thanksgiving, to enter into your gates and courts with praise, that in everything we are to give thanks, for this is your will for us in Christ Jesus. And for those of us who have the memory of our past sessions together, we are indeed grateful that we have come away from those sessions conscious that you, the living God, have been gracious to draw near to us. You have not left us to a mere sterile encounter with notions and ideas and concepts, but you yourself have drawn near and refreshed us by the word and your spirit has made your son and his will dear to our hearts. And while we thank you for past blessing, we do not rest upon it, but we say with the psalmist, we love you because you've heard our voice and attended to our supplication. Therefore, we will call upon you as long as we live. So we call again, pleading that you would draw near to us, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. We would seek to embrace in the depths of our being the truth of the words of our Lord Jesus who said, without me, you can do nothing. Lord, we confess we are so slow to unlearn the ways of creature confidence, but we want to learn it. We want to embrace it. We want to know childlike dependence upon you and your grace. And so we come on the threshold of this new unit in this first lecture, and we cry to you, give us the promised grace of the presence and ministry of your Spirit. We look to you in the expectation of faith. Hear our cry as we offer it through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> now as we take up this first lecture this morning, as you know from your announcement of this unit and from your notebooks, that this is unit number two in considering the work of shepherding, overseeing, leading, and governing by the man of God in the pastoral office. Now, just a brief overview of the previous modules. Module number one, we dealt with the vital issue of the call of the man of God to the pastoral office. Module two, 
the life of the man of God in the pastoral office. And then modules 3, 4, and 5, we address the preaching ministry of the man of God in his pastoral office. And then the last module, module 6, the work of shepherding and overseeing of the flock of God, part 1. In module 6, I gave the first part of our study on this vast and vital theme of the work of shepherding and overseeing of the flock of God, and in that unit I sought first of all to address two very vital aspects of this second great area of the responsibilities of those recognized as gifts of Christ to serve within his church as pastors and teachers. The things I addressed were the task in its essence, and the heart of that material was an examination of the five words or family of words by which God both defines and describes the task of shepherding and overseeing the flock of God. And then we considered the task in its prevailing disposition, those things that must characterize the state of our hearts and give flavor to the entire spectrum of responsibilities connected with the labor of overseership, the labor of shepherding. And then the first specific category of concern we addressed was that of our responsibilities in conjunction with the planning and the leading of those public gatherings of the church for worship and for ministry. In beginning to address this subject, I stated that such services can be divided into two basic categories. Category one, services clearly mandated by the Word of God, and secondly, services precipitated by ecclesiastical and cultural traditions. We had time only to address directives touching that first category, namely those gatherings of God's people that are warranted by the Scriptures. That includes the ordinary services of the gathered church for worship, for the ministry of the Word, and in all of those services, along with the Lord's Supper and baptisms, we will be engaged in leading the congregation in prayer and in reading the Scriptures. And so we concluded that unit by lectures dealing precisely with those two issues, how to cultivate the gift of public prayer and how to cultivate skill in the public reading of the Scriptures. My first task in this module is to set before you guidelines relative to that second category of gatherings of the people of God, namely those services precipitated by ecclesiastical and cultural expectations. And as we take up this subject together, we begin, first of all, seeking to answer the question, is it biblically legitimate for a pastor to conduct such services? No matter how many reverends may do it, we are committed to have the track of our ministerial labors laid by the Scriptures. And so we need to raise and answer this question. Is it legitimate for a pastor to agree to conduct such services? They are not clearly mandated by the Scripture. They're precipitated by cultural and ecclesiastical traditions. Are we to allow such traditions to dictate what we do? Well, my answer to that question is a resounding but a qualified yes. It is legitimate to agree to conduct such services, but only within some clearly prescribed conditions. In the text of Scripture, which in my judgment gives clear justification for conducting such services within specific conditions, is Galatians 6 and verse 10. 
the book of Galatians, chapter 6, and verse 10. In this text, we read, So then, as we have opportunity, let us work that which is good toward all men, and especially toward them that are of the household of faith. In our cultural setting and in many other cultural settings, to take the responsibility to lead a funeral or a wedding does indeed give a marvelous opportunity to do much good for the cause of Christ, for the proclamation of the gospel, and for the service that we can render as Christ bond slaves who, in the language of the Apostle Paul, take the posture of being bond slaves for the sake of those to whom we minister. In Edie's commentary on Galatians, we read, there is no occasion to limit the meaning of this epithet. It is the thing which is good in each case as the case may occur. The good thing may vary according to various wants, for it is to be done pros pontas, towards all. Weiner, and then he quotes another commentary, the entire paragraph has the idea of doing good, underlining it. The restoration of a fallen brother, verse 1. The bearing of one another's burdens, verse 2. Communication on the part of the taught to the teacher, verse 3. Unwearied well-doing, verse 10. And this verse seems to sum up all these thoughts in one vivid injunction, which not only comprises all of the previous, but enjoins similar social duty in all of its complex variety. Whatever its immediate form, whether kindness or beneficence or mercy, whether temporal or spiritual in character, it is still good in its nature. And it is the good thing adapting itself to each case as it may turn up in reference to all, generally or more specifically. And I say amen to those comments of Edie. So in answer to the question, should we engage in leading such services? Yes, I believe it is biblically warranted. As we have opportunity, let us do good to all men. And I do believe that this is one of the legitimate, though there are manifold illegitimate uses of the 1 Corinthians 9 passage, but I believe a legitimate outworking and application of 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 23. For though I was free from all men, I brought myself under bondage to all that I might gain the more. To the Jews, I became as a Jew that involved some cultural, dietary, religious conformity that I might gain Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law not being myself under the law, that I may gain them that are under the law, to them that are without law as without law, not being without law to God, but under law or in lawed to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak I became as weak, I became all things to all men, that I may by all means save some and I do all things for the gospel's sake that I may be a joint partaker thereof. And I'm personally persuaded that weddings and funerals in our cultural setting and in many others give us a wonderful opportunity to advance the cause of the gospel and to do good to those who desire our services in connection with weddings and with funerals. And then you have, of course, the example of our Lord. We are told in John chapter 2 that his first miracle performed in Cain of Galilee, in which he showed forth his glory, was his presence at a wedding feast 
and not only his presence, but his prominent activity in turning water into wine. And likewise, in John 11, we find Jesus attending a Jewish culturally oriented funeral with professional whalers carrying on their whaling. And in that setting, our Lord ministers graciously and powerfully and so displays his glory that that very act of raising Lazarus from the dead turning the funeral into a time of resurrection is what precipitates his own ultimate death. Now then, I've stated, yes, I believe we should seize these opportunities, but with some qualifications. And I want to lay before you seven principles that I believe should condition our thinking and our actions in conjunction with these services not precipitated by scripture, but by cultural and ecclesiastical traditions. Number one, never relinquish your position and identity as a man of God who in all things is to be subject to the word of God. Never, never relinquish your true position. 1 Corinthians 7.23 says, You have been bought with a price. Be not the slaves of men. Men have their expectations of the reverend. Men will try to impose those expectations upon you, even though some of them would mean you'd have to contradict your true identity. And you determine at the outset, I will take part in no wedding, no funeral, that in any way undermines my sense that I am Christ, purchased property, set free by that purchase to be his bondservant, I refuse to become the slave of men. You see, it is critical to keep this principle in mind since there are many in our increasingly pagan and secularized society who will still desire to have their weddings and funerals graced by the presence of what they perceive to be a nice religious guy, to lend some religious flavor to their wedding, and maybe even hopefully to preach their unconverted pagan loved one into heaven at the funeral. All they want is a reverend to be present to lend some, quote, sanctity to these events, a religious nice guy who will mouth some pious platitudes and make everybody feel good. You must determine, no, if I take a wedding, if I take a funeral, I will not relinquish my position and identity as a man of God who in all things is subject to the word of God. I'm very thankful that some of these principles, God put me in circumstances early in my ministry that forced me to wrestle with them. When I lived many years ago, I mean I lived for many years, up until several years ago in Cedar Grove, 25 Meadowbrook Lane, and uh, it's been a very stable neighborhood, and one of the neighbors, the very next door neighbor, was Glenn and Elaine Wiswell. We got to know them quite well. They were utterly unconverted. She is a devout Catholic, goes to Mass very faithfully, even several times a week, at least in the past. But her husband, Glenn, was a totally irreligious man, a hard-drinking, chain-smoking, very industrious man, but utterly a stranger to anything spiritual and the grace of God. And... He contracted lung cancer, and he died, and I get a phone call from Elaine. Al, you know Glenn had no connection with the church. He never went to church, had no concern about church, but I'd like to have a decent funeral. Will you be willing to take his funeral? It's going to be held at a funeral parlor in the middle of town, just down the hill, less than a mile and a half away. Well, my first reaction was, Elaine, I'm honored you'd ask me. Of course, I'll take the funeral. We'll let a little time pass, and we'll talk about how we'll handle the funeral. So I hung up, and then I got thinking. I said, oh, whoa, wait a minute. 
if I'm going to be a man of God, I'm going to read the scriptures of the Old and the New Testament. I have got to preach Christ as the only Savior of sinners. The necessity of having personal dealings with Christ. I knew that their closest friends was the family two houses away. Here's the Martins, there's the Wiswell, there's the Rubinsteins. Not exactly an Irish name. And this Jewish couple was their closest friends. And I got thinking, oh boy, I preach Christ clearly. And Elaine has asked me, and the Rubensteins are her closest friends. I said, I've got to tell Elaine. So I called her up. I said, Elaine, I'm not backing off from my commitment to take your husband's funeral, but I feel I owe it to you to tell you certain things. You are a Roman Catholic. And even as a Catholic, you profess to believe that Jesus Christ is the only Savior of sinners. I didn't say that it's by faith alone you're saved. I found a common touch points. And I said, you believe that the Scriptures are the Word of God, the Old and New Testaments. And the last thing I want to do is to be an embarrassment to you in your time of grief at your husband's funeral. But if I take the funeral, I will read scriptures from the Old and the New Testament. I will somewhere state that Christ is the only Savior of sinners and that we must have personal dealings with him. And Elaine, if you feel uncomfortable with that, I will not be offended if you find some other pastor. There are plenty of them that will give you just a straight uh, garden variety funeral. I'm asking you, do you want me? You know what she said? She said, Al, what you've told me is exactly what I would expect of you. And I had the privilege of standing in that funeral parlor, concluding my message that began with Ecclesiastes to get the Jewish couple. I said, the wisest man who ever lived was not a Gentile. He was a Jew, and his name was Solomon. And Solomon said, it is better to go to the house of mourning. That's how I let in. But then when I came to how do we prepare for our own death, there is but one way. Hear the words of the one whom we must come to know. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me shall, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. God burnt into my heart in a deeper way this principle. The opportunity to good, do good must never, never crimp who and what I am as a man of God. I'm to be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. I'm to use every bit of holy guile I can use, but never forgetting I stand before the God in whose presence I will one day give an account of my ministry. So there's my first qualifying statement. Never relinquish your position and identity as a man of God who in all things with weddings and funerals is to be subject to the word of God. Secondly, never compromise truth and righteousness in order to get an opportunity to speak the truth or to win a future hearing for the truth. Never compromise truth and righteousness in order to get an opportunity to speak the truth or to win a future hearing for the truth. And I've listed 2 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2 as a key text. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, Even as we've obtained mercy, we faint not. We have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by the manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And here again, this was very early in my ministry, back when I was still in the denomination there in North Coldwell. And a very dignified couple showed up at my doorstep. And I invited them in. 
They introduced themselves. They said, we live just a few blocks away in a rather upscale section of North Coldwell, and uh, we're going to get married, and we're wondering, since you are a local church and a local pastor, whether you'd be willing to do our wedding. I said, well, that all depends. We'll have to talk. So I made an appointment. They came to my study. Well, to make a long story short, as I got the facts, they were both divorced. But as I probed for the facts of their divorces, it was clear that neither of them was divorced in God's eyes. They did not have scriptural grounds to put away their spouses. And then I wrestled. If I tell them the night you come together, if you haven't already begun to come together, you will be entering an adulterous relationship. God help me. 28 years old, scared witless. I thought, but then I'll lose them. If I just somehow get around this and they see I'm a nice guy and I'm kind to them and I perform their wedding and send them on their way, then they might come. And if they come under the sound of the word, they might get converted. God took this principle and stamped it on the fleshly tables of my heart. Never compromise truth and righteousness in order to get an opportunity to speak the truth or to win a future hearing for the truth. And likewise, if you're invited to take part in the wedding with another reverend, you've got to find out who is he, what does he believe. You stand before a group of people in a wedding with a man who is a liberal, who denies essential saving truth. You give the impression he and I are for the same thing. That's a lie. That's a lie. No matter what good you might do, God never wants us to do good at the expense of truth or of righteousness. And so whenever we accept any opportunity, we must make sure we are not publicly declaring that there is no antithesis between truth and error. In this day of pluralism and what we might rightly call a society drunk with the wine of ecumenia, we must not deny this antithesis that exists between truth and error. Therefore, before accepting an invitation to officiate at a wedding or funeral, you must ask whether or not other ministers will be involved. If so, what are their fundamental theological perspectives and convictions, if they have any? Don't appear in a public service and with them and thereby declare we're both about the same thing. No, 2 John verses 10 and 11 are clear. If anyone comes unto you and brings not this teaching, receive him not into your house, let alone don't stand with him in a house of worship and give the impression you're for the same thing. Give him no greeting, for he that gives him greeting partakes of his evil work. All right, third qualifying principle is this. Do not assume that in order to be a man of God, true to his calling, you must of necessity precipitate offense and make enemies. Some people feel if I don't make enemies, I must be compromising somewhere. Well, remember these scriptures. John was no compromiser, and yet we read concerning John in Mark 6 and verse 20, these very fascinating words. Every time I come across them yearly in my own devotion, they strike me afresh. For Herod feared John, knowing he was a righteous and holy man, and kept him safe. And when he heard him, he was much perplexed, and he heard him gladly. How do you explain? I don't know, but there it is. It's in the text. So don't feel that, that if I don't precipitate open opposition, I'm somehow failing to be a man of God. Romans 12 and verse 18 is a very helpful directive with respect to matters of this nature. If it be possible, as much as in you lieth, be at peace with all men. And the parallel passage, Hebrews 12, 14, follow after, 
Dioko, persecute, track down with intense concentration, follow after peace with all men, as well as the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. And then you have Luke 5, 29 to 32. Jesus is seen in a social setting with the riffraff, publicans and sinners, but they are comfortable with him and he with them, the ones who are offended are the Pharisees. Your master eats and drinks with sinners. Yes, he does. And he does not necessarily seek to offend them unnecessarily. And we're back to that injunction of Matthew 10, 16, when the Lord commissions these and sends them out, be therefore wise as serpents, harmless as doves. Last summer, I had the privilege of conducting a wedding for uh, one of my adopted grandsons. Many of those present at the wedding were typical, unconverted American pagans. And I was very conscious of God's help in seeking to apply this injunction of our Lord in the way I planned the service and actually spoke at the wedding. Dorothy and I received a lovely note from the young couple subsequent to the wedding. And I quote part of the letter to underscore the point I'm now making. Here are patently ignorant, unconverted young people in their early mid-twenties, uh, college associates of the bride and groom, etc. It would have been very easy unnecessarily to provoke them to anger. But I consciously labored to see where I could find any chinks in the armor and not unnecessarily offend without compromise. And then I got this lovely letter from the young couple. Dear Grandma and Grandpa Martin, thank you so much for coming to the wedding. It was great to have you both there. Grandpa Martin, thank you so much for agreeing to marry us. It meant so much to both of us. You made the ceremony focus on Christ's call for a bride and groom instead of platitudes. So many of the guests were touched by the sermon and some of our non-Christian friends were coming up to me later and asking me about it. It has been a great witnessing tool. That made my day. And I said, thank you, Lord, for your help. So don't feel that, you know, you got to have a chip on your shoulder. Don't feel that if people are not gnashing their teeth, you've somehow not been faithful. No, faithfulness may result with God using your labors to lasso some and draw them under the influence of the gospel. My first, fourth word of counsel is this. Do not assume that to be a man of God, you must convert every culturally precipitated ministry into an extensive and pointed evangelistic meeting. Don't feel you are under divine obligation to convert every culturally precipitated ministry into an extended and pointed evangelistic meeting. I've heard of pastors so boorish that someone in the community asked them to take the funeral of a relative or loved one in a marvelous opportunity to do good to people and they end up completely unnecessarily blowing the opportunity, going as a total stranger, cold turkey into a setting and just thundering out about hell and this man may even now be screaming in hell just total unseemly behavior. We can never imagine our blessed Lord being that callous and that indifferent to human suffering and to sinful blindness and not seeking to be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. Over the years, in the dozens and dozens of weddings that I've done, for I was doing weddings before I ever became a pastor, so it's been over 50 years that I've been conducting weddings and funerals. And there are times you get a zealous young couple, and they want you at their wedding to preach a 45-minute hellfire damnation sermon. I admire their zeal and their desire to nail their flag to the mast. 
But I've just had to tell them very sweetly, you got the wrong man. I am not going to. People do not come to a wedding to have a 45-minute evangelistic sermon. If when they gave the wedding invitation, they say, if you come to my wedding, the preacher's going to preach your ears off. All right, fair enough. Then you're sitting there waiting for the preacher. He's going to preach your ears off. But it's almost like a breach of contract. When people give an invitation to come to a wedding, they expect a wedding. And if it's in a church and a pastor's there, they expect the religious elements. They're not going to a justice of the peace. But they're not expecting a full-blown evangelistic service. And likewise, at funerals, 1 Corinthians 13, 5, that's the key text. Love does not behave itself unseemly. It is unseemly to be that insensitive and then go away proud. I am bearing the reproach of Christ. No, you're bearing the reproach of your stupidity to do something like that and your boorish insensitivity. My fifth word of counsel is this. You must give careful and detailed planning and direction to these kinds of gatherings. Weddings and funerals, you must give careful and detailed planning and direction to these gatherings. Your own experience validates the observation that in any group situation, people feel uncomfortable and ill at ease if they sense any uncertainty and hesitancy in the one who's leading that particular service. You know how you feel in the presence of s s s s someone who's got kind of... You're already feeling it, right? A man with an aggravated stutter. You're, you're feeling for him. You're feeling pity. You're feeling uh, embarrassment. But you don't feel confident to sit back and receive what he's going to say. And often, tentativeness in these situations is simply the fruit of not giving careful and detailed planning and direction to these gatherings precipitated by cultural and ecclesiastical traditions. Once again, a key text is 1 Corinthians 14.40. There's the watchword text. Let all things in connection with public gatherings of the people of God be done decently and in order. My sixth word of counsel is this. You must reflect in your person, your dress, and your demeanor the climate you wish to be evident in such gatherings or that you believe ought to exist in those gatherings. Such things begin with your attire. Before you ever open your mouth, people see your person. They see how you are dressed. They see how you approach the place where you're going to lead that service. Whether you saunter up with your hands in your pocket whether you stride up uh, like you're part of a military parade or whether you walk up with a sense of confident, quiet dignity, all of that is sending out signals to the people. Your dress, your attire, your demeanor, your gait, whether you stand up and you look like you've either sucked on lemons or you're about to scold a naughty child or whether you stand with an uplifted, pleasant countenance, with a little bit of a smile playing off the corner of your lips. Some of us have had to practice in front of a mirror to learn how to do that. Why? For Christ's sake. We have a naturally wrinkled brow and a naturally sober countenance. You know how I learned that? In a way that shocked me? I was president of my senior class in college. And when the yearbook came out, I couldn't believe it. There was a little caption under a picture of me apparently talking to someone saying, Prexy ponders. And when I saw that picture, I said, do I look like that when I'm seriously engaged in conversation? They said, yes, you do. I said to myself before God, that's going to change. I worked on relaxing my brow 
my dear Swedish grandmother used to say to me, Albert, the wrinkled brow bespeaks the serious mind. She tried to comfort me with my wrinkly brow, but I said, I looked angry. And I said, I've got to work on that. So I worked on how to relax, how to come before people with a pleasant look. They'll find out soon enough I got other looks. <laughs> but I don't want to confront them with that. I want goodwill to be speaking to them from my very countenance. The show of their countenance testifies against them, the prophet said. You can tell where they're coming from by what they look like. Well, in the positive sense, our countenance should speak goodwill and kindness toward those in whose presence we are going to minister. And I've given you these various texts. You can look them up at your leisure. I believe they clearly support this whole perspective. You remember John tells us our Lord Jesus quietly wept at the graveside of Lazarus. You have your two words for weeping. One is the wailing of the professional wailers. The other is just to shed tears. John says, Jesus shed tears. Jesus wept. But when it was time to raise Lazarus, John says, he cried with a loud voice. Perfectly appropriate when you're calling a man out of the tomb. But when it was to show the empathy, behold how he loved him. His gentle shedding of tears. Obedience to the command to lift up your voice like a trumpet might be very appropriate the Lord's Day morning, but totally inappropriate the next day at a funeral, in a small funeral parlor, to thunder as though you were standing in a large auditorium. I'm just underscoring again that love does not behave itself unseemly. It seeks to find the appropriate expression of countenance, of voice, of dress, of demeanor, of the gait of our walk, all things, sending out signals. We are men who are serious, but men of goodwill who want to do good to those before us. And then my final word of general counsel is this. You must cry to God that you may be clothed with the power of the Spirit in all your leadership involving these ministerial functions and opportunities, funerals and weddings. In every situation where we come conscious we are God's men, in that situation in one way or another to reflect the truth of our God, to do good to the hearts of our hearers, to accomplish that, we need the present powerful ministry of the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 2, 1 to 5, 1 Thessalonians 1, 5, Luke 11, 13, and then that marvelous text in Acts 6, 10, they could not withstand the wisdom or the grace with which Stephen spoke. And that should be us men, that there's something compelling in the wisdom and the grace, the demeanor, the manner, it's not insignificant. It is said they saw Stephen's countenance and it shone like an angel. The Holy Spirit highlights his very face, bespoke something of the true state of his soul. I say then, as a concluding comment to these seven qualifying principles, during my many years of pastoral labor, some of my most wonderful opportunities for gospel preaching have come in the setting of these culturally dictated services and opportunities for showing kindness to men and women simply because they are image bearers of God. On the other hand, what a privilege it is to labor on the behalf of dear brothers and sisters who long that the occasion of their wedding or the season of being with them in the house of mourning will be grasped, as it were, by the forelock as a gospel opportunity to present Christ and his grace and his saving mercy both to friends, loved ones, visitors, whoever is present, 
that people will leave if they've never had before or subsequently any exposure to real biblical Christianity, we have given them by the grace of God that exposure and put a hook in their consciousness. That man spoke like he really was concerned for me. He spoke right to my eyeballs. There's no question he was sincere. He wasn't just reading, mumbling words out of a preacher's black book or out of the liturgy of the church. And yet he talked about my need and a need that only could be met in Christ. And yet he was obviously sincere. He obviously goodwill just oozed out of him toward me. They should go away scratching their heads saying, I can't figure all this out. And a hook is put into their consciousness that there are some people for whom Christ and truth and salvation and biblical realities are real. And you embodied that reality in what you said, how you said it, in the whole demeanor that you conveyed. So, should we take these opportunities? I say yes. But in taking them, we must remember those seven vital principles and by the grace of God seek to implement them in the outworking of our opportunities at weddings and at funerals. Now, I think what I'm going to have to do is break off this lecture. This is one that I thought would spawn a second one. And then in the next hour, we'll then give specific guidelines for the planning and conducting of weddings. If I have time, we'll take up funerals. If not, we'll take them up tomorrow morning. I'm determined that we're not just going to skim over these things. You brethren know that basically these modules are bringing to birth what has been a major dimension of my life's work. And I'm conscious that my life is in the last lapse. I'm not on the front end of the race, even though I've got good genetic program to live a rather long and full life. But I have no assurance, and I'm eating up very quickly my 10 bonus years. I just got three of those left, and I will be four score. And I'm conscious of that, and so I want to birth these things in as full and rich a way as God enables me to do. So I think this is a good time to break. Let's pray and thank the Lord for his help and presence in this our first session. Let's pray together. Father, we are so thankful for the opportunities you give us as your servants to do good unto all men. And we thank you that in our present cultural, religious setting, we have these opportunities with these uh, situations of weddings and funerals, but how we pray that in them all we may remember these vital principles, that we may never, in pursuit of advancing your truth, compromise that truth in any way. Make us consistent, but gracious, loving, tender, wise men of God, and that people who are married under our direction and oversight of their weddings will be able to look back and savor the sweetness of that occasion. And funerals we conduct, may we be instruments in your hands to comfort your saints, to speak clearly and pointedly, but winsomely and lovingly to those who know you not. Lord, left to ourselves, we are a mass of ignorance and we bumble the opportunities given to us. We need your help. Grant us that help. To the praise of your glory we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.